Hello everyone and welcome once again to Advocacy Talks, our final Advocacy Talks for 2022. We're delighted to have Melissa Carney who works with Guiding Eyes for the Blind with us today, a guide dog school based in the United States that provides exceptional guide dogs to individuals who are blind or low vision for greater independence. As Community Outreach and Graduate Support Manager, Melissa's main goal is to utilise her empathy as well as our passion for advocacy, inclusion and the human guide dog bond to support independence and fulfillment while encouraging the public to respect their needs, rights and aspirations as guide dog teams. Melissa provides various resources on both a graduate community and individual level and assists in resolving access, discrimination issues that arise in the field, directs continual accessibility improvements at the school and offers blindness and guide dog awareness presentations for a wide range of audiences. Melissa empowers guide dog handlers to share in the development and triumphs of their advocacy skills. She currently resides in New York with her first guide dog, a male fellow Labrador named Aaron, who she received in 2016. In her spare time, she enjoys taking long walks or jogs with her four-legged best friend, horseback riding, reading, socialising and anything at all to do with music. In her presentation today, Fundamentals of Advocacy, Melissa will touch on many of the topics she addresses with her students, such as increasing confidence as an advocate and problem solver and adapting to various barriers and allowing proper time to process and practice self-care. Today's presentation will be recorded and available on our website, on NCBI's website, under the policy and advocacy area. And please, if you have any questions um, for Melissa, please put them in the chat line and we will ask Melissa at the end of her presentation. A big welcome to you, Melissa. Thank you for joining us today from the United States. And uh, we'll look forward to hearing what you have to tell us about um, what's happening over there. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. This is actually my first international presentation, so it's extra special for me. Thank you so much for having me. In my role at Guiding Eyes for the Blind, as was mentioned, I help empower our students, applicants, and graduates at the school to become self-advocates and to feel comfortable stepping out of their shell and speaking up for their rights as guide dog teams. Um, so I'll be going kind of, I'll be going over the fundamentals of what we teach our students as far as advocacy. And I can also touch on, touch upon some of the common scenarios in which guide dog teams might have to advocate for themselves. Now, as people with disabilities and as folks who are blind or visually impaired, we already have to do a lot of advocating before you add a guide dog into the equation. So oftentimes people are coming into Guiding Eyes for the Blind or other guide dog schools and programs with that basic knowledge. We're always advocating for accommodations in school, for example, for accessible formats, uh, for even image descriptions on social media posts. Those are kind of the simple ways that we advocate that we may not even think about on a day-to-day -day basis, but we're still doing them. And when you add a guide dog into the equation, not only are you advocating for those things, but you're also thinking about, starting to think about laws that impact the, free, the freedom that you have and the right that you have to bring a guide dog into public spaces. So you're advocating on public transportation. You're advocating when you walk into a store or restaurant and the general public and employees within that store or restaurant don't know the laws yet. So you become that educator and have to step into that role. Um, in the United States here, and it might also be a problem in Ireland, but we're experiencing a lot of issues with, uh, with, with cab service denials. So companies like Uber and Lyft are now kind of taking over here um, instead of uh, the taxi scene. So there's a lot of advocacy that we have to do when we're educating drivers on why they cannot deny us rides. Um, 
Also, even thinking about something as simple as asking someone not to pet our guide dogs. It's something that the general public are drawn to. They're very cute animals and it's understandable, but we have to speak up and say that it's very distracting to us as a team and it hinders us from traveling independently and safely because a distraction can mean the difference from navigating cleanly around a, a street sign or a pole or a store aisle to running into something and causing ourselves and our dogs harm. So advocacy comes in many forms. Um, so that's kind of a bit about the situations that I might talk about with my students. Any Again, anything from public transportation to airports to restaurants and stores, hotels, housing. Um, you name it, there's a situation that I've probably encountered either myself as a fellow guide dog handler or with my students. Um, so I thought it would be helpful today just to kind of go over some of the main lessons of advocacy and some of the main themes of advocacy, whether you have a guide dog, whether you're a cane user or whether you don't use either. I think these skills are fundamental to your growth as an advocate. So I wanna start off by just thinking about an acronym that I use for the word advocate. And this is a bit a bit long, but it's less about the words that I'm going to use and more about the themes that run through advocacy. So when I think of advocate, I think of, first of all, A, awareness. So understanding situations that warrant advocacy. D, for diligence or direction. So knowing how to move forward and how to address the situation accordingly. V for variability, understanding that there's no one size fits all approach to any given scenario. And sometimes we do need to think on our feet. O for overcoming adversity. So navigating challenges that arise and preparing the best we can both mentally and physically. C for confidence, one of my personal favorites. And that would mean utilizing your strengths whenever possible and staying in control of the situation. A for adaptability. Do you have to change your approach based on what the situation demands? T for tenacity, remaining persistent, polite as you educate whenever possible but also remaining firm and standing your ground. Some issues, as many of us know, do not have an instantaneous solution, so that persistence is key. And finally, another personal favorite, empowerment. So as an advocate, you are going to use your strengths, utilize your resources, and the more you, you advocate for yourself and the more you practice that skill set and adapt that mindset, you're going to feel empowered. You're going to feel as if you've conquered one situation. Why can I, why, how can I conquer the rest? You're going to feel motivated, inspired by what you yourself have accomplished. And oftentimes what that empowerment also does is it encourages others to use their voices and to use you as an example to become advocates themselves. So it's really helpful to think about those themes as you're going through and really kind of thinking about what truly is advocacy and how can I either start my journey with it or enhance my journey with advocacy. So. Now that I've given you that, that brief overview, I thought it would first be helpful to go into a more detailed explanation of those themes and also provide an example. Because like I said earlier, you might not even realize that you're advocating for yourself as much as you do on a daily basis. So let's say that you're being denied an Uber or a Lyft or a taxi cab. Um, let's say you do have a guide dog. And this is, again, a common scenario that I walk my students through, right? So if we're applying these themes, if we're thinking about awareness in that state situation, that's understanding and having an understanding of the laws before you go into the situation and knowing 
what you are entitled to, what your responsibilities are as an advocate, and understanding that a denial of service is inappropriate behavior. So that sounds pretty straightforward, but sometimes we have a hard time, especially those of us who are who are endlessly nice. We we often wonder, okay, are we just being nitpicky or are we actually being denied service? Um, and and we worry about inconveniencing someone else by speaking out. And we don't have to deal with those feelings of guilt because we have a right to speak out and to speak up when we notice that something's wrong. So that awareness that you can, that awareness that you have the capability to speak out and it's well within your, your rights and you have strong reasons, that's that awareness component. Now, when we apply diligence or direction, our D for at, and the word advocate in this situation, we're thinking about, okay, how do we move forward? How do we confront the situation? Is it something that we can address right off the bat? Is it something where we have to maybe take a step back, right? What is our direction here? What is our end goal? Um, so in this situation, you think about what is the driver's main issue with transporting my dog? Is it that he or she is blatantly refusing? Is it a matter of fear of the dog? Allergies? What's what's truly going on here? Try to get to the bottom of it. Because that will dictate how you move forward and educate the driver and potentially use compassion to work out a solution and give them an understanding of the law and their obligation to transport you. So that's that direction is really taking a beat to evaluate the situation. All right, then we come to V for variability. So again, understanding that there's no one size fits all approach. And sometimes we do need to think on our feet. So we may have prepared the best we could, but now the conversation is moving in a different direction than what we expected. Right, so so suddenly it's just blatantly refusing to take the dog, and then it comes out that this person has a fear and may, maybe has trauma taking a dog, right? So you might have to take that compassionate approach or demonstrate that your service dog is well-behaved and will not cause any harm and will just lay on the floor in the vehicle, right? So it's a matter of, again, that variability, thinking what is this situation demanding. Right? As far as overcoming adversity, oftentimes this is emotional, right? Because when we, when our access rights are trampled on, when we feel like we are in the midst of a harmful interaction, it's easy to get angry. It's easy to just completely lose ourselves in um, in the injustice, and that's understandable. But if we do that, we are giving ourselves less of a chance to overcome that challenge. So in overcoming adversity, oftentimes that just means staying calm, um, applying what we talked about with, it, with variability and direction and thinking about, okay, before this gets out of hand, my biggest challenge is um, is thinking about how to respond to this emotionally. Sometimes the hardest part within that overcoming adversity is understanding when you need to take a step back. So a lot of us just want to fight the situation. We want it resolved in the next five minutes. And sometimes that's doable. But if you are exhausted, if you feel like you or if you have a guide dog, that dog is in danger, it's important to understand that and not to put yourself in physical or emotional harm's way. So it's okay, it's perfectly acceptable to take a step back. And we will talk about in a little while, picking and choosing your battles, but it's completely fine to take a step back. Report the, um, in our case, we'd report the driver 
um, and we'd report it to the Department of Justice in the United States. So it's perfectly okay to fight that battle a different day, the next day, even a couple hours later, but just give yourself the freedom to overcome that challenge in a way that feels right to you. Right. So next, going through this, um, this example, we then have confidence, right? So we're thinking about utilizing our strengths whenever we can and staying in control of the situation. So say that you are very confident in your people skills. Again, it's about appealing to that driver and calmly explaining, this is my guide dog and this is what he or she does, right? Being confident in that you know the laws, you are familiar with your rights and you will continue to speak up for those rights. Confidence that if you do get into this vehicle and you convince the driver to take you and, and follow the law, confidence that you know your guide dog will behave and you know even through that ride, you're going to continue educating the driver and make it a pleasant experience overall. So it's utilizing your people skills, what you know you're good at, what you have faith in, to build your skills as an advocate within that situation. A for adaptability, right? So this is a bit similar to variability, but also, also different, right? And this all connects back to, um, to overcoming challenges and picking and choosing your battles. So if you start one approach and that's not working, you can always change your tactics. Say one Uber ride happens another, or one Uber ride denial happens after another, right? It doesn't mean you have to approach that situation the same way. Every driver is different, every situation is different, every time you advocate could be different and you can always experiment with your skills. You're not glued to one strategy of advocating for yourself. And similarly, if you find that the approach of working alone isn't helping and you want to ask a friend to speak up on your behalf, if you want to bring other people into the situation, talk about it on social media, just build a community around these issues. That's also adaptability. That's you saying, I don't want to handle this on my own this time. So I am going to find that support network and adapt accordingly, right? T for tenacity, remaining persistent. So in this situation, right, say you file a complaint with the company after you've received an Uber or Lyft denial and you don't hear back from the company or all they say is, oh, we're just gonna give the driver a slap on the wrist and, um, and give you a $5 credit. Well, it's up to you. If you don't feel that's an appropriate solution, you don't have to let it go there. You can continue to advocate for your rights and persist and say, this is not acceptable. I think the driver should be educated. I don't think the driver belongs on the platform. Whatever you feel is appropriate, it doesn't mean that the solution you get is the end all be all, right? You can always ask for more if you feel that it's right. And you can always take it to the next level. So maybe you join a community of stakeholders that share the same opinion and you work together on. Um, so here, for example, it might be uh, members of the National Federation of the Blind or the American Council of the Blind. You might want to participate in their survey and provide feedback. You might want to join their transportation issues committee and, um, and help develop solutions and work personally with the company to make sure this doesn't happen again. So again, that persistence is all in what you make it, but it doesn't have to end with just the situation itself. And finally, E for empowerment. So your persistence, your confidence, your ability to adapt, your variability, your awareness, all of that is going to empower you with an understanding of how best to advocate for yourself in the future 
And I hate using this saying because it is a bit cliche, but practice is perfect. So the more you advocate in these situations, the more you experiment and find your rhythm, the more you're going to love, well not, not maybe not love, because oftentimes we're not in love with the situations we're in when we have to advocate, but you're going to, you're, you're going to have a bit more enjoyment advocating for yourself because you're going to know what you're doing. You're going to feel comfortable stepping out of that comfort zone and finding your voice. So that's empowerment. And that's just kind of an example of how you might think of that acronym for advocate and applying it to real life situations. I thought it would be helpful um, for the next couple minutes now to talk about a few things that we don't often realize about advocacy. Because for many of us, it's especially when we're younger, it's a very intimidating word. Right, everyone says you have to advocate, 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 advocate. And it's scary, especially if you're shy. I myself was extremely shy as a kid. And I, like, I swear I wanted to start shaking whenever I heard that word because it always seemed like such a big, large scale event. And what I didn't realize that if you break advocacy down, you don't, you don't realize what the fundamentals truly are and how you're already utilizing them in your day-to-day -day life. So along those lines, we don't often realize when we're advocating for ourselves. So for example, if you, I'm going to use a couple that are related to blindness specifically and a couple that aren't because we do advocate for ourselves a lot outside of just blindness. So some examples of blindness might be asking for a textbook in, in an accessible format. It might be commenting on a friend's status on Facebook. Hey, can you provide me with an image description? Um, Non-blindness examples. This might be something as simple as, hey, I have a food allergy. I cannot eat this. Is there something else? Is there an alternative that I can eat instead? Right, so just thinking about those things that we do every day. And not to mention, whenever we walk into a store, if you shop on your own, you're asking for shopper's assistance, right? So maybe you're not shopping entirely um, on your own, but you're still asking for that assistance. That's still independence, that's still advocacy. So those examples that we just don't think about, and every time we're advocating in those small ways, we're building that confidence. We're empowering ourselves. It doesn't have to be this big, large scale, intimidating event. And if you put it like that in your own mind, you're only limiting yourself because you don't realize how far you've already come. The second fundamental is that self-advocacy skills do not develop overnight. So we're only human. We're not expected to be perfect. We're not going to have this giant repertoire of advocacy skills right off the bat. And just like I said earlier, that's why that practice makes perfect. That comes into play here, right? Because we're always changing our views on advocacy, changing our strategies, evolving as human beings. So similarly to how we might grow in our emotional capacity, our book smarts, um our understanding of of life adulthood bill paying <laughs> all of those all of those things we're growing as advocates as well we're developing we're maturing we never truly stop maturing and developing there's always that desire to grow in most situations right so again just thinking about that you know, thinking about that as not a stagnant effort, but a continuous one and something that we're always building on. Third, while self-advocacy may mean that you speak out on your own, you do not have to do it alone. So this is kind of what I talked about earlier with the fact that it's okay to pull in a support network. If you don't have one, it's okay to search for one. 
and utilize your community. And I think it's important to normalize when we've had a bad day, when we're exhausted. Again, you are human. We don't have to be warriors all the time. It's okay to admit, you know what? I just feel like crying it out in a corner. I, I don't want to deal with this right now. And ask other people to help carry that burden for you. There is no shame in that. There's absolutely no shame in that. We all have those days. You know, for me, it might be the 50th time someone's asking to pet my dog or I'm just trying to get on a subway and people are grabbing me and preventing me from getting on the train car. You know, it. we have, we do have our breaking point when we're like, okay, I really, I really just need to step away from the situation or I need to reach out for support because I'm just having a tough time coping with it right now. And, and sometimes it is too much, especially given all of the other emotional baggage that we might be dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Advocacy is just one part of that. So again, it's okay to utilize your support system and let other people carry that weight for you. And oftentimes we may not realize it because many of us kind people out there don't wanna burden anyone, but a lot of people are just looking for us to pass the baton and just say, hey, I, I really need you because it also feels good on the other side to be needed and to be that friend and that family member and that supporter. A lot of people are ready to lend a helping hand and ready to step in if you only give them the opportunity. So again, no shame in speaking out and asking for help and camaraderie. The fourth fundamental is sometimes you have to choose your battles. It's only natural to feel run down after a certain period of time. So just like you might pass on the situation to others or reach out to others for help, you may also say, you know what? It's not worth it. I'm tired. I've had enough issues to cope with this week. I'm just tired. And there's no shame in that either. You are not, as an advocate, expected to fight every injustice, to solve every issue. That's just not humanly possible. So if you've had enough, if it's a smaller scale issue that's not urgent, pick and choose. That's okay. Again, you don't have to find the superpower to fight everything off at once. And along those same lines, you can prioritize. So say, let's say there's a safety hazard, right? Someone <clears throat> keep, continues to leave trash cans or carts or something in the middle of a store aisle, your apartment complex hallway, if there are ac physical access barriers, that's a safety concern. That might be something you want to advocate for, right? But if you're thinking about something like, I'm trying to think of a good example. If you're thinking about, okay, you know what? This flyer about an upcoming event that was just sent out over email, it's an inaccessible PDF, right? And you may want to be like, oh, well, while I'm advocating for these physical access barriers, I want to advocate for this paperwork to be accessible. And you may want to take it all on at once. Or you can give yourself a break, call someone or send the PDF to someone, ask them to read it to you or convert it yourself, whatever. And then focus on that battle the next day or the day after that. But just prioritize and think about your safety and your comfort first. And just give yourself that time to breathe. I can't stress that enough. Give yourself time to breathe. We all deserve that no matter what. And the fifth fundamental for advocacy is we never truly stop learning about self-advocacy. So whether you're 20, you're 50, you're 70, you're 90 years old, there's still room for growth. There's still room to learn. You're still developing as an advocate. You're still finding your voice. And that's perfectly acceptable. 
you might have a strategy 40 years later that you never would have even dreamed about. You might find as you get older, you get more blunt. And you don't, you don't maybe, you know, think about other people's feelings as an inconvenience. And you say, you know what? I have a right to, to be mad and to show that I'm frustrated. Or you might think to yourself, you know what? I was, I was such a spitfire when I was, <laughs> when I was younger. Maybe, maybe I want to tone it down now and come up with um, more, more patient strategies. You, you know, you never know how you're going, how your advocacy skills are going to change, but just know that they probably will. And if they don't, then maybe they've just improved. Maybe you've just gained more confidence in how you've advocated for yourself. Um, but remember that it's never ever stagnant, nor should it be, because just as society is evolving, um, education and awareness surrounding disabilities is evolving, so are our advocacy skills and the needs that come with it. So right now, we're advocating for greater accessibility of, let's say, touch screens at different kiosks, right? We're not, uh, you know, like maybe 20 years ago, I was advocating for accessible computers, um, accessible phones, things like that. It, the, the needs have changed. And so, so have our advocacy efforts. So just another thing to stress is that you will always continue to grow as an advocate. You'll always continue to learn as an advocate. With that, I think, I, um, I think we're ready to open it up for some Q&A. I know there's been a lot of fundamentals, a, a big acronym that I've covered, and I want to make sure we have plenty of time for that interactive component and that I'm just not talking at you the whole time. Uh, but I just wanted to reiterate that it's been an absolute pleasure spending time with you all today and being part of my first uh, international presentation. Advocacy is something that's very dear and near to my heart, something that I've experienced, something I continue to learn from, from watching my students, graduates, and fellow people who are blind or visually impaired go through. I'm always adapting my strategy from those people. Um, and, and one more takeaway is I, I think the biggest lesson I've learned as a guide dog handler and as someone who's blind is to not, you don't have to say, I'm sorry when you're advocating. I think I was always someone, for example, who said, I'm sorry, you can't pet my dog right now. He's working. And I don't have to apologize for having a voice or for disagreeing because that's my right to, to have a service dog and to speak up because he doesn't have a voice and we cannot be distracted as a team. So that's just a lesson that I'm, I'm personally learning from others and I'm adapting to. So think about your community, think about your role models and think about yourself and your own skills and think about that upward growth and that forward momentum always. Melissa, it's Liz here. That was absolutely wonderful. I'm so heartened to hear you talk about the uh, lifelong skills of advocacy and how it's as we are changing as human beings, so are our skill, skill development, the prioritization of issues that we have to have compassion for ourselves, that we don't need to be, I think you said, warriors all the time. Uh, and we'll wear ourselves into the ground if we do. And some of your your real um, down to earth applications of issues is is what is is extremely useful for our advocacy network members, many of whom would be listening today. A couple of questions have come through there with regard to the taxi uh, example of a dog being refused. Can you tell tell us how how you might obtain the taxi driver's details? If you want to, if you decide mm. to report them to the authorities for refusing to take your dog. That's a great question. So what I do and what I advise our students and graduates and fellow um, people who are blind or visually impaired, um, there is a way to take a screenshot. I believe it's if you hold or if you press the, if you have, if you don't have a home button, it would be the lock button and the volume up button simultaneously. You can take a screenshot, assuming your screen curtain is off. Um, you can take a screenshot of all their details. So that'll have the license plate, the name, 
the driver rating, things like mm -hmm. that. Um, for Lyft specifically, if we're talking about that rideshare company, they actually have an entire phone line dedicated to service animal denials, which is fantastic. And we hope that other that Uber and other taxi cab services will will have that. Um, but it's become pretty easy and standard for um, report for strategies for reporting those drivers. What we're concerned about now in this realm is the proactive education for drivers. So how can we prevent this from happening in, um, how can we prevent this from happening? Not only how can we solve it in the moment and re report it in the moment, but how can we educate these companies and encourage them to then pass on that education to their drivers? That's, that's kind of what we're focusing on now and really hoping that the volume of complaints and reports that have been filed will spark, uh, will spark a movement within the Department of Justice um, in the US specifically. That's that's great, thanks Melissa. And another one here, can you talk about the difference of, and challenges um, you've encountered when you're advocating for yourself or for others? I would say, uh, I think, the biggest challenge is that a lot of, and this is a challenge partially, but there's a certain, I call it unintentional ignorance that I see a lot with members of the general public, with people who are blind, with guide dogs. There's just, it's not taught. Um, and I don't know if, if Ireland is the same way, but here in the US, it's not commonplace in our school systems to be taught, our universities. Disability is just not focused on. So oftentimes people have no idea what the experience is like for someone who's blind or visually impaired or what a guide dog's true job is. Some people don't even know what the harness means, right? So I find that one of the biggest challenges is kind of explaining, for example, um the implications of why can't i pet the dog there's a certain amount of entitlement that that people have like oh but the dog's cute the dog's in front of me i need to pet it and sometimes even when you try to explain that the dog is working and we have a responsibility to keep each other safe sometimes people are like oh well you're you're really rude like that's my right and it can be very frustrating to explain no that's that's not your right and it does cause a safety concern for for us handlers and as a person with a disability i rely on my service dog to travel independently in my community to get to go through daily life to go shopping to go on the train to go on the bus uh to, to travel for work there's so much that goes into it and i i feel like if people just took a step back I looked at the greater implications and not just what they wanted out of the situation um, and utilize their compassion, it would be a better place. And, and that's kind of, I would say, the biggest challenge we we run into is, is people's kind of entitlement and they know it's best. Um, and I would say one other issue that is becoming a, a very, it has been a very hot topic, is the challenge of the suffering reputation of service animals, legitimate service animals, because of emotional support animals. Now, mm -hmm. emotional support animals have a place, but they are first and foremost pets that provide instinctual comfort. Service animals have protections under law because they have been specifically trained to assist people with disabilities, and they have the public access training that's needed to behave appropriately and not be a threat to the public. Um, so we're running into a lot of people who, um, restaurant owners, who don't know the questions that they can ask by law and they just see a dog with a vest and let it into the restaurant. But then that dog is growling at other pa mm. patrons. The dog is acting out, uh, maybe defecating on the floor, you know, like just really inappropriate behavior. And so the next time a dog walks in, even if it's a legitimate service dog, they think, oh boy, 
I don't want that dog in my restaurant because the last dog caused so many problems. So that's a big challenge in advocating for ourselves. We have to not only build an education, but also, also um, address misconceptions and try to take those out of people's heads, which is a lot of work. So there's kind of those two approaches that have that need to work in tandem with one another. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. And yeah, that's certainly an issue that's happening around the world. The lack of regulation around um, assistance animals as opposed to guide dogs and the amount of training that guide dogs get as opposed to to assistance animals and the issue you just mentioned, I've come up against so on several occasions of what's happened when a, an assistance animal who hasn't been trained for the length of time that a guide dog would be has has misbehaved in a restaurant or, and it's caused issues for for people going in with guide dogs. So it looks like some of those, unfortunately, some of those issues are very similar around the world. Um, and yeah. Madeline or Lorna, did you did I see another question coming through there that hasn't come up on my screen? Yes, it's Lorna here. Thanks so much, Thanks, Liz. Lorna. And, and uh, sorry, it's uh, something in the some gremlin in the system in the background, as there always is. Um, but thanks so much, Melissa. Um, again, uh, just a, an awful lot of what you've said there has really resonated. And the every day being a school day or always learning and developing, I think, is is uh, something that I think a lot of us can can resonate with as well. And um, one question that uh, came through there was around how you decide on the approaches that you take in different advocacy situations. So I think you mentioned there about the the fact that you need to have that adaptability and, and variability, I suppose, as well. Um, but do you talk to people to decide on what process you want to take? Do you do some research on trying to decide um, what approach to take to try and advocate on, on an issue? Or um, how, how do you make those decisions? I suppose that's the, the question there. That's a great question. I think there's there's two things. It's a matter of thinking about, can I be proactive or reactive? So first, you know, of course you want to do research on your local community. What are entities that protect me? What are entities that are familiar with the law and disability education and could be resources to me? So here in the United States, for example, we have what are called protection and advocacy agencies in each one of our 50 states. And um, they're all part of the National Disability Rights Network. So those entities are in charge of um, of, of providing us with with lawyers and legal support to address a lot of the Americans with Disabilities Act violations that come up and just advocating for greater accessibility around the country. Um, it might also be a matter of, you know, um, if you're being proactive, thinking about educating your police departments, the law enforcement in your area. Um, what if there's an emergency? How can they best assist someone who is blind in their service dog? Um, you know, or just someone who is blind in general. So thinking about who could be your community partners and allies. Um, so that's something that I, I frequently think of when, when deciding to think about advocacy in a proactive way. Uh, reactively, I think about when, when you're figuring out how to approach the situation and advocate for yourself, sometimes it's really helpful to first think of the person's intent. So that may be harder to gauge at sometimes versus others. But for example, if, if, you know, you can just tell if someone is out for themselves or they are compassionate. So for example, um, if someone's petting my dog and is also having a conversation with me and not just honed in on the dog, I know that their intent isn't necessarily, and it rarely is bad, but I know that they're also viewing me as a human being and they're just not they're not just laser focused on the dog. So that might say to me, OK, I have more of their attention so I can make this a nice, calm, polite interaction. Um, maybe we can have a, a genuine conversation for a few minutes. And this is someone who's open to education, open to treating me like a normal person um, who has who has a voice. Now, if there's someone who is um i have this problem all the time and many of you might as well but let's say i am paying for something on a cash register i have many experiences with cashiers who will talk to uh, let's say i have a friend with me they'll talk to my friend and say 
oh, is she paying with a card or cash? Is she, um, you know, is she satisfied with all these items she picked out? You know, talking about me in front of me. In that case, you know, okay, maybe their intent isn't to be rude, but their intent is to leave you out of that conversation. So that indicates, okay, this is my time to insert myself and correct this behavior right away. And I might have to educate in a little more of a, of a blunt way and just, again, insert myself in that situation and speak up and say, oh yes, I am paying with a card. Yes, I'm happy with everything that I'm about to purchase, right? So it's, it's about kind of stepping in there. Um, Similarly, right, if um, if you are um, getting into, uh, I'll go back to the taxi example, if you're getting into a rideshare vehicle, right, and the driver just seems really nervous, um, you know, you, you might look at their intent and say, okay, they're not being mean, maybe it is a matter of trauma, maybe it is a matter of just patiently educating. If someone's blatantly rude to you and just screaming at you, I cannot take the dog. Yeah, that, that's probably not someone who is is ready to be compassionate and ready to listen to you. So that might indicate to you, okay, let me prepare right now um, to have to back out of the situation because I'm not going to get, it doesn't look like I'm going to get anywhere with this person. So maybe now I have to get comfortable with the approach of um, of fighting this battle a different day. And just just walking away from the situation and reporting the driver and not putting myself in harm's way. So again, it's just it's just looking at the mannerisms and the um, just the general attitude and behavior of the people you're interacting with, and just trying to make a judgment call based on how they're approaching the situation and therefore how you need to approach the situation. That's really helpful. Thank you so much, Melissa. Liz, that's You're all welcome. from me, so I'm happy to hand back over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Lorna. Melissa, can I just say that is such an, what you've just said, there is such an important aspect of advocacy, isn't it? That we, I think you covered that in awareness and variability, the, you know, that w when we're confronted by situations, rather than in the heat of the moment, push through, sometimes ask ourselves, what's the best way to get an outcome here? Is it to go home and, you know, just think, OK, I'm going to ring somebody up or um, or is, is, is it something I can do immediately, like at the cash register so that we're we're actually thinking more strategically and more rationally, even in amongst that that kind of a situation? Because if we focus on the outcome of getting the education across or the awareness, we won't be thinking of necessarily getting a, a result in the moment because it might not be that might not be possible. Right. Exactly. Well, I've learned a lot today and I think I'm sure everyone else has on the call, Melissa. Um, your first international call, we'd love to have you back sometime <laughs> next year. I'm sure there's, we could have gone on for another hour or so, I'm sure, talking about this. Is so, there is so much to learn and I'm sure everyone that has listened today will take something away about um, the advocacy they're already doing, the approach of, you know, of being strategic about it, about your lovely acronyms. I'll certainly be using them <laughs> in, in our advocacy networks with your permission, because absolutely probably having that kind of focus and something to work around until your skills become more natural and more embedded is a really useful structure to have in advocacy. So, you know, from a heartfelt thank to all of us for, for coming along today. It's been absolutely inspirational listening to you and um, wish you a happy Christmas over there. And I'm um, and um, we'll probably talk again next year sometime. Thank you so much. Have a happy holiday season, everyone. And thank you so much again from the bottom of my heart to for having me here. It's been an absolute pleasure. Okay, thanks, Melissa. Keep up the great advocating over there. <laughs> I will, thank you. Bye for now. Bye-bye.